Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's quarterfinals debate. My name is Noah Keeney, and I am the chairman of this debate. The timekeeper is Owen McAvoy. This debate will be judged by a panel of three adjudicators, who are Ms. Harama, Mr. Hazel, and Mr. Parasadis. The topic for this debate is that Lounding should not have been sacked. But the affirmative team seated to my right is from Emmanuel College. The negative team seated to my left is from Emmanuel College. The speaking time for this debate is eight minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time, and a double bell will sound at the speaking time. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched off. I did declare this debate open and called upon the first affirmative speaker, Jaden Groom. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Loinick has been a prominent political cartoonist for many years, constantly tiptoeing around the line of what is comfortable for an audience and what isn't. Yet, his work is often abstract. It is each person's interpretation of it that makes it offensive. During the pandemic, as ever, Loinick decided to create controversy. Only this time, he lost his prominent Monday morning cartoon in The Age, one of the most read articles and one of the most, Australia's most popular magazines on one of the most frequently used days of, this, of the age. The topic for tonight's debate asks whether Loinick should have been sacked from that position. Allow me to begin our definition by setting the foundation on which we will build our case. First, self-evident, we'd like to establish that Loinick refers to the Australian cartoonist Michael Loinick, who was removed from the age and their newspaper, the newspaper's prized Monday editorial page position. We can find sacked to the loss of this particular position rather than any further repercussions he may have faced. Before I move to establish a contextual foundation for our team, allow me to present a team split. After a contextual discussion, I will pose a distinction between misinformation and commentary to convince you that Loinick's piece is exclusively an artistic commentary and should not be lumped together with the plethora of anti-science material that has been spread through the pandemic. Our second speaker will first develop this by explaining how restricting commentary on any public de decision is harmful to society, rounding out, by this point, rounding out this point by reinforcing that what happened to Loinig is in fact a restriction or discouragement of such commentary. Next, she will explain how in, in the context of similar pieces in, of art and occurrences, Loinig's sacking stands out as less reasonable than other circumstances, continuing with a nuanced discussion. Finally, she will round out our case by explaining why the offence caused by Loinig's piece is a good thing and separate the overall consequences that generically restricting expression will have, why Loinig's piece makes a net positive contribution and why it is unreasonable for him to be punished for it. Our third speaker will rebut and sum up our team's case. Now to set the foundation for our overall case by breaking down the meaning and consequence of Loinig's contentious piece. The piece itself is actually very simple, plain even, it has four main elements, a cartoonish person, a tank, a syringe, which has replaced the tank's barrel, and a photo of the infamous Tiananmen Square tank man. That's it. Those four elements are what got him sacked from his role. It's helpful to take each element away one by one to see what is actually offensive. First, the tank man. Everyone has seen the infamous image where an unknown protester, or the unknown rebel as he's sometimes called, standing in front of four Chinese tanks as they drove down a central Beijing street, projecting power to discourage the mass protests that had, been taken, had taken over Beijing in the days prior. This man represents the people's resistance to the violent crackdown on their freedoms, a temporary success in halting the advance of authoritarianism. The man was, however, whisked away quickly by Chinese police and has never been seen again. His identity has been debated, but confirmed, never confirmed since that day. Through the cracks of censorship, which has removed that image from light within China, the unknown rebel is hailed as a hero of democracy for standing up against authoritarianism and paying what may seem to believe is the ultimate price. This is thematically confronting for many. This image is sacred, one of the most potent depictions of the death of democracy. And Loining has used this image in context with the syringe replacing the tank barrel pointed right at the tank man, the ordinary person, the average Australian in this case. This is the first thing that could be wrong with Loining's cartoon an uncomfortable moral equivalence between whatever a syringe tank represents and one of democracy's dying moments. Next, let's look at the syringe tank, syringe and the tank. A tank is shown of, is a show of material violence. Not very many things can stop a tank. A measly person certainly can't. 
which is why it's so potent for the barrel of the tank to be replaced by a vaccine syringe, because the connotation of hard force and destruction associated with the tank are immediately transferred to the vaccine. In my view, the connotation is almost delivered by the vaccine, that the vaccine will have its way, that we can't stop it, and that it will do so on its own terms. This is the other thing that is wrong with Loening's piece, the affiliation of force, authority, and violence of the tank through the syringe representing vaccines. Now, to me, that's pretty uncomfortable. Force, authority, and obedience delivered through a vaccine on the same magnitude as one of the dying moments of democracy. But that uncomfortable thought is good, because that piece didn't say anything, doesn't say anything. It just poses an idea. It doesn't engage in facts. It doesn't discredit the arcs, acts of science, or in fact, the efficacy of the vaccine. All it does is draw some uncomfortable conceptual connections that we, the audience, are supposed to process and form our own opinions on. That's no reason to lose an artistic position, and I and my team will go on to explain why. To start my substantive point, I want to make clear the distinction between critiquing policy and critiquing science. Over the past few years, public debate surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic has been polarizing, with some groups refu refuting what they refer to as the so-called science, and others fully backing this science, doing all they can to prevent COVID infection. And of course, each of these sides strongly condemn the opinions and actions of the other. But this conflict over the science behind COVID, health and medicine is not what is at play in Loening's cartoon at all. The cartoon is not a critique of COVID science, instead it's a critique of COVID policy. Taking a closer look at the cartoon, the only reference to the science of COVID is the vaccine needle on the end of the tank barrel pointed towards the lone person. This is intimidating, right? Yes, it's supposed to be. Loening himself has said that art is uncomfortable, critiquing policies and governments and how they affect the individual. As he put it, my cartoon was not about the value of vaccines. It's about the punitive deprivation and coercive authoritarian force being increasingly and systematically applied by federal and state governments. That's all a bit of gobbledygook, but from my perspective, he's making it clear that his critique was not on the science behind vaccines, or even their importance in the effort to reduce the spread of coronavirus. Rather, it seems that he wishes to critique the authoritarian policies and actions taken by the Australian state and federal governments in relation to vaccine mandates. Obviously, however, people have been offended by this and have taken more extreme interpretations of the artwork. Yet this was not accidental. Again, this artwork was purposefully created to cause discomfort. It is offensive. There's no <coughs> doubting that. But there is a distinction between offensive artistic commentary and harmful anti-science. Of course, we agree that spitting out blatant pseudoscience, spreading misinformation and endangering public health are completely unacceptable. But in no way is that what Loening is doing here. His artwork makes no obvious reference to the efficacy of vaccines or the importance they have. It is merely a critique of the way in which the government is dealing with them. This cartoon is no different to the countless other examples of Loening's work, which critiques government policies and actions. And while they may or may not be just as offensive, they did not directly contribute to his sacking like this cartoon did. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I've displayed the two things that can be considered offensive relating to Loening's cartoon. One, the Tiananmen Square con connotation, and two, the connotation of a tank and the force and authority displayed through the syringe. In my substantive point, I showed you how these two elements constitute commentary rather than misinformation. So ladies and gentlemen, this distinction is why learning should not have been sacked. Thank you.
I call upon the first negative speaker, Maz Shara. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, chairperson and timekeeper. The topic of today's debate is that Loinik should not have been sacked. And as the negative team, we believe that this statement cannot be further from the truth. The points I will be arguing are that Loining was inconsiderate of his societal position when he chose to weaponize cartooning as a means of public influence, and that it is within the rights of the age as a business to fire him. Our second speaker, Olivia, will present the points that the cartoon for which Loining was fired is offensive and ins insensitive of the ongoing COVID situation, and that Loining has, to fa has failed to grow and adapt as an artist. Our third speaker, Edward, will rebut and summarize our team's case. Before I make my points, I'd like to address definition and rebut some of the affirmative team's arguments. We find the definition provided by the affirmative team to be lacking and would like to redefine, we would like to define the phrase, should not have been. We believe that this phrase implies that Loinig did not morally deserve to be sacked from the age. Now I'll move on to rebuttal. The first affirmative speaker has uh, suggested that the offense taken to the cartoon made by Loinig is based on individual interpretations of it, and that what the cartoon provides is plain and simple. Well, as goes with all forms of art, it is the magnitude of influence of the artwork or the speech that is implied that, is va that has influence rather than, rather than how much materially is provided. Uh, as in how much the intricacy of the artwork or, or the features within it. Furthermore, the lack of democracy and mandatory vaccination are unrelated, unrelated things. And there was a comparison between a syringe and a tank, which can be taken to be highly offensive considering that a tank is a mass murder weapon whereas a syringe is used in the medical field, which is for the treatment of the health of the public. This attributes a threatening quality to the vaccine, which, which has a connotation of panic that it seeks to arise within the population. Furthermore, there was an uncomfortable thought that, that came from the cartoon, which was actually not inherent to the Daniel Andrews vaccination campaign, rather it came from how it was being associated with the Tiananmen Square Massacre, which was entirely Loinik's work. This is why his ideas are thought to have violated the age's intention to maintain its neutrality and value information more than providing opinions. Moreover, the cartoon seems to suggest that there is a problem in the, in the vaccination policy, but does not provide an alternative or solution that could better the situation. Now I'll move on to opening the negative team's case. Firstly, as an esteemed cartoonist for a renowned news organization, Roenig held a highly influential position that he was inconsiderate of when presenting an absurd and an unhelpful idea to the public. According to the Ethical Journalism Network, accuracy, independence, impartiality, humanity, and accountability are the five core values of journalism. And it is unequivocal that Loening has violated all five of these to some degree through his cartoon. Although the image was posted on Instagram independently of the age, it was still done so under his name. Loining, being part of, being part of the world of journalism, represents the age, represents the Australian public, and represents journalism at large wherever he bears his public image. It is extremely inconsiderate of him to use the influence of this image to put forward an outrageous idea. People in the field of journalism serve the public. They serve the public by gathering, presenting, and analyzing facts. And in this manner, they ensure the future of truth and justice by keeping the public informed rather than controlled. The cartoon seeks to divide the public on the issue of mandatory vaccination by radically and provokingly presenting the view of those to, who refuse vaccines. This is potentially stigmatizing rather than helpful to these people. The contemporary COVID situation has the potential to cripple the country if prompt measures are not taken. As an estimated 16% of the population comprises the elderly, who are among the most vulnerable. The vaccination campaign in Victoria is well intended to address this grave issue, 
and therefore is incomparable to the authoritarian Chinese regime that took the lives of those who opposed it. Suggesting that the Victorian government threatens people for refusing to take vaccines, and that, the, and, and that this threat is comparable to Chinese martial law, is blatantly and unjustifiably cynical. This is far from maintaining neutrality, which is expected from all those who represent journalism in the public eye, and is especially needed in this time of crisis due to the pandemic. The cartoon is not only unhelpful due to its influence, but it also aims to spread panic by reminding its audience of an abhorrent historical atrocity for no legitimate reason. I'd like to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, is Loinick's cartoon accurate? Does it uphold impartiality? Does it respect its audience's sensitivity to the idea of massacre being associated with a medical campaign, especially in this difficult time when countless are dying of disease? Having shown such a scant level of consideration to the values of the age, did Loinick have any right to remain in the organization? Now I'll move on to my second point, which is that it was completely within the rights of the age as a business to fire Loinick for committing an action that is not befitting of the organization. As previously mentioned, Loinick's use of social media does not free him from the burden of upholding the values of journalism that the age abides by. Social media is a powerful tool that has sparked a discussion regarding the future of truth and information. It appears that any individual is able to establish an online presence and disseminate their opinions in reaction to major events. These opinions are often inadequately supported, misleading, and damaging to the reputations of news organizations, who, on the other hand, are striving their hardest to protect the public from the deception of such biased sources. By following in the footsteps of such ultra crepidarian individuals, <coughs> while bearing the name of the age, Loinig has dragged the organization down with him to their level. Not only does the age possess the right to free its reputation from the consequences of his stunt, but it has a moral duty to do so, for the sake of the future of Australian journalism. The organizations that employ people to contribute time, effort, and service to the public must distinguish themselves from those unaccountable individuals who advocate for unfounded and unhelpful stances on serious contemporary issues. The damage that Loinick has caused to the age has not been reverted, but the organization has undoubtedly taken the correct measure in setting a precedent a precedent for the consequence that should befall any employee who, who works against its interests in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, due to the ongoing COVID pandemic, our nation is currently facing a crisis that impacts each and every one of us to some level. This debate is not on any aspect of the government's management of the pandemic. Rather, an organization's exclusion of an individual for abusing their public influence to cause panic is being taken to be a matter of dispute. It cannot be more obvious that a news organization has a duty to ensure that its adherence to the values of journalism is recognizable, even if this requires them to fire an employee. After all, it is for situations like the ongoing pandemic that the reliability of public information needs to be reinforced the most. Thank you. I call upon the second affirmative speaker, Ali Orwood.
ladies and gentlemen of the audience, esteemed counterparts of the opposing team. The motion of this evening's debate is that learning should not have been sacked. And as the affirmative team, we unequivocally believe that this statement is correct. Ladies and gentlemen, learning is an artist. Offence is almost part of that job description. As the affirmative team, we obviously believe that learning sacking is quite unreasonable. Before expounding upon this assertion, I must first move to expose some flaws in the opposition's reasoning. The first affirmative speaker has, has said that the classroom that learning created has been taken to be highly offensive, to which we would say, yes, it has. And that is a good thing, as I will further expand in one of my points. They've also said that it attributes threat to the vaccine, thus potentially promoting pan promoting, provoking panic. We would say, not necessarily, this simply provokes thought. It doesn't necessarily say anything about um, the policy. Uh, it doesn't attempt to make a claim on the policy in and of itself, rather provoke thought in the individuals that see. They further stated that the age values information um, and truth-telling, which, which is correct. However, this applies more to journalism rather than cartoons. They further stated, or they further attempted to apply standards relevant only to journalism, to Loinick, who is a cartoonist, who makes cartoons, which is an art form, which is very different from journalism, which, yes, they are right, is aimed at inform being informative, um, is not supposed to be controlling, rather informative. However, it is quite unreasonable to apply standards of journalism to artwork. It doesn't make any sense. They've also, tried, uh, they've also attempted to say that it is quite unreasonable for learning to simply draw comparisons without providing an alternative solution. However, we, we would say that this runs contrary to the aforementioned attempt for the age to value information over anything else. Ah, uh, yes. They've also said that it's perfectly within the rights of the age to file learning if they so wish, which we would say, yeah, okay, sure, but that has no bearing over whether or not they should. In fact, according to their own definition, this is about what is morally wrong or right to do. Legality is not always aligned with what people believe is moral, and it is quite often, in fact, the subject of debate. Moving on to my first point. Oh, sorry. Moving on to our summary. Our first speaker... Our first speaker has already established what is offensive in Lunik's case as the foundation of our case, as moved to draw a and moved to draw a distinction between misinformation and commentary, explaining why Lunik's form work fits firmly in the latter. On to my first point, that sharing opinions and making commentary on governance and policies that impact so many people's lives should in fact be encouraged, and that in this instance, the offence caused was in fact a good thing. My second point focuses on the example at hand and how this is not a good example of reasonable restrictions in place. And my third and final point is that the restriction of such artistic, not journalistic, commentaries is a great harm to the broader society. The fact that these policies impact so many people is why it is not just okay, but necessary to critique them. It is important that people have conversations over whether the decisions being made by those in power are good ones, and political commentary, like Lunik's cartoon, is often how these conversations start. Regardless of whether the commentary is fair or necessary, it is always important to question authority. I'll expand on this later, but for now, allow me to focus on this set example. When it caused more than just a bit of a fuss, various figures and plenty of ordinary people were very offended. They shared this offence over many social media platforms, resulting in some rather interesting comments. But what were they offended about? Was Lenny spreading misinformation? It would appear obvious that this is not the case, as there is a significant difference between the facts of the matter and what is done with those facts. Learning was not challenging any facts, rather, he was challenging the response of the government to those facts. Crucially, Loinick states that, My cartoon was not about the value of vaccines. It is about the punitive deprivation and coercive authoritarian force being increasingly and systematically applied by federal and state governments to, parent, to parents who want choice in the matter. Agree or disagree with how emotionally worded the language was, he does have a fair point. Ladies and gentlemen, this is in no way seeking to, or even does it, misinform the public. The public were outraged rightly or wrongly so. But what did this outrage do? It caused discussion. It promoted conversation. Some people think he's a numpty. Some think he has a fair point. Either way, it was beneficial to have the conversation and to allow and promote the expression of opinions on such highly relevant political matters. And to my second point, following on from this, that you should not be fired for critiquing policy. Having already established that this is what he was doing, critiquing the policy rather than the facts, I seek to further explain that, whilst promoting misinformation and legitimately harmful behaviour can and should result in deplatforming, questioning the status quo should not. 
For example, after spreading misinformation surrounding the 2020 United States presidential election and contributing to the January 6th insurrection, Donald Trump was banned from Twitter, Facebook, and almost every other social media platform. Even more recently, the infamous Andrew Tate was banned from many social media platforms for spreading harmful misogynistic views. These are valid reasons for deplatforming someone. Nobody here has simply facilitated a discussion. They have specifically distributed objectively incorrect information and or actively encouraged dangerous behaviours all very explicitly. Wernig did not say women are property or COVID is less lethal than the flu mid-pandemic, by the way. He drew a picture of a man standing in front of a tank with a vaccine for a barrel, thereby encouraging a conversation and offending quite a lot of people in the process. The art may create an uncomfortable thought, but it does not actively spread misinformation. The only commentary it makes is the threatening slash forceful nature of vaccine mandates. It does not discredit any underlying reasoning and is purely a critique of a policy decision. The two reasons why learning's work is controversial. Having already explained the benefits of critiquing policies, especially those that affect so many, it is not only an okay thing, but a very good and a necessary thing. Having, for, having already explained that, I now move to my second point, which adds to this by detailing exactly why preventing such critique can be a very damaging thing. First, an uncomfortable moral equivalence between whatever a syringe tank represents and one of democracy's dying moments. And second, the affiliation of force, authority, and violence of the tank through the syringe representing vaccines. I take briefly from my first point that in a general context, discouraging and preventing commentary on government decisions is harmful and dangerous. No one should feel at risk from voicing an opinion that doesn't collude or misinform. In this specific instance, in regards to this relevant pandemic, comparing an extreme, the Tiananmen Square massacre, to the imposition of government through the vaccine mandate is valuable because it allows us to properly and comparatively gauge the level of authority that we see around us, that we are comfortable with as that, as that authority is enforced around us. The aim of the piece is not to say that one is equivalent to the other, but rather to ask us what level of imposition we are comfortable with. When I first looked at the cartoon, I disagreed. When we as a team discussed the topic, we generally disagreed with the connotations learning introduced, and our opinions are strong uh, because the issue is topical and remains very important. There is no doubt that the mandatory vaccination campaigns that are the result of this pandemic are unprecedented. Not for many, many decades has such an imposition of government occurred. It is right that we are debating this, and it is right that we are encouraging people to care. With that concludes my final point. So, in summary, quite simply, we, the affirmative team, believe that learning should not have been sacked. Thank you for your time and attention. I now call upon the second negative speaker, Olivia Bryant. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and respected chair people and timekeeper. The topic of, tonight, of today's debate is that Luning should have not been sacked, and as a negative team, we believe that this statement cannot be farther from the truth. Our first speaker has already, it has already spoken to you about how Luning was inconsiderate of his societal position when he chose to weaponize cartooning as a means of negative public influence, and that it was within the rights of the age as a business to fire him. I will now present the points that 
The cartoon which Luning was fired for is offensive and insensitive. And that Luning shows the inability to learn and grow as an artist. I'd like to begin by rebutting some of the opposing team's points. Firstly, outrage can be very different from conversation. When people are evoked by a strong emotion, what they respond with will not always be what we would consider a clear conversation. When you trip and you scruff your knee, you're in a yell and pain and you're being mad at the sidewalk and you're generally gonna be very upset and what you say will come out of a place of emotion rather than logic and you won't be able to reflect on maybe it isn't the sidewalk's fault for being there, maybe you were the one who tripped, just as an example. Due to the simple nature of Lunig's comment, Oh, secondly, to the simple nature of Luning's comment, it cannot always be clear what he's criticizing. While it can be inferred that he is criticizing the government, art can only speak in so many words, and so it does. And by speaking in words, it is also sending a message to, and it's much more vague, which can lead to misinformation in the outrage. I would like to now begin my speech. Now to my first argument, which is the cartoon that Lunig produced was overtly offensive and in insensitive to many and was, the, was, in, was an in, improper use of the historical events likeness and imagery. To preface, the historical event that Lunig used to create his cartoon was the 1989 Tiananmen Square Massacre, which was a series of protests of the corruption within the Chinese government party in the hopes of of achieving democratic reforms within China, which has been a continuously historical issue. BP BBC reported in 2017 that this massacre re resulted in at least 10,000 deaths of those protesting. On the contrary, the cartoon produced by Leaning was an, art an artistic protest of the vaccine mandate, as expressed with imagery in the solidary caption of mandate under the post. Leaning, as a person, perhaps not a contact contracted journalist or artist, as the first speaker discussed, was un but as a person was undoubtedly allowed to pr protest such mandate, as any such person is. And he could have done a more sensitive job to doing it without linking it to the age on his very public Instagram account, which will be linked. He could have had the same effect or same conversation with a following that maybe was not as linked to the age. However, to back to back to the cartoon, to draw such parallels to a mass massacre is overtly offensive because of its loose to no connection. The 1889 to Tiananmen Square massacre was a protest to have a voice in in the government, a political a political issue us Australians have had the prob the privilege of not experiencing. Luning could have made a much clearer connection to the past government possible government mandates during such other devastating medical issues <laughs> by both in which people with diseases were treated where their rights were undermined by the government and society in general. He could have drawn a situation from this to make a much clearer criticism. The government should never go without criticism or conversation over policies. However, Luning's choice to compare the vaccine mandate to the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre shows clear intent to show, a, to sh to show the threat of democratic, democratic rights of Australians by linking it to an extreme case where thousands had to die to, to get what we currently have. This undoubtedly can, will, and has invoked out offense and outrage from the public because, uh, because of the absurd focus on the political aspect of the mandate which fails to acknowledge any benefits that may bring. And because of the cartoon, it's so simple, it's hard to show that nuance. Making it a flat and one-sided argument without showing the nuance of the issue, which will encourage people to feel attacked over their democratic rights rather than possibly their bodily rights, which Looming was more so trying to show. And these people will feel the need to defend their views, freedoms, or self when it has not yet come anywhere near to this extreme. This comment is inconsiderate as it 
inconsiderate as it's more weaponizing the massacre to encourage people to go against the government because of fear than rather informed conversation, which devalues those people's lives that were lost as they're not being honored, but instead used in a politically biased cartoon, which is not creating a conversation or making much of a criticism by linking to a parallels or elaborating and, and elaborating on clearly stated facts, but instead evoking strong emotions from the audience to encourage people to go against the mandate instead of in educating them with a fulfilling argument. I will now speak to you on my second point, which is Linding's inability to grow and adapt as an artist. For this is not the first time Lunig, Lunig has been known to provoke a political or simply just outrage the public. Nay, is it the second time, but it is the third. He has seemingly repeated the same artistic methods to convey a political message. Whether it is his intent to cause political outrage or not, he should be able to recognize in the way he's trying to convey his political ideals, it is causing people to have notable reactions that seem to differ from conversation, rather just seem to be upset. His first instance of outranging the public was in 2015 when he strongly implied the Victorian government were fascists for mandating children must be fully vaccinated to attend daycare. He, in this comment, he also failed to mention any benefits to this or making it a one-sided argument which provoked no nuance on why the public should take a closer look at the subject, instead just causing mixed strong emotions from the public causing havoc. The age was justified in the sacking of Lunig as he shows an inability to grow and open discussions over political topics as Lunig should have seen the similarity that these two comics have to another and adjusted his approach to demonstrate a more, more depth to his point to open a conversation and reduce general liability of making such comics. Cartoonists hold a responsibility to be very precise with their image and artistic expression. Because when care is not put into accurately and fairly simplifying images and events, things can be drastically misinterpreted and cause outrage because of complex, because sometimes complex concepts cannot be made out from over, oversimplified images and which causes chaos and confusion and general upset from the public. The age were within their right to sack Lunig for the outrage over sensitive and his outrage for over sensitive and nuanced issues he repeatedly caused outrage over he repeatedly causes by his inability to learn to show two sides of an argument with concise cartoons that do not simple do not oversimplify and thus mis miscommunicate his complex ideas thank you I call upon the third affirmative speaker, Ilya Aitman. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for tonight's debate has been that learning should, have been, should not have been sacked. As the affirmative team, we undoubtedly believe that you should not have been. I'll start by addressing a few of the negative uh, flaws in the negative team's case, starting broader and working towards more specific points. A key point of contention between the affirmative team and the negative team is what the effect of learning's art actually was. The practical effect. That's why I started. The first thing that they brought up time and time again was that that, that that piece of art caused panic and, as the second speaker explained, created misinformation through the emotional response to that piece of art. Now, there needs to be some nuance about this. 
The art didn't necessarily cause pa panic. In fact, it didn't at all. The art presents a clean slate from which people brought their own opinion to. There is an element uh, in considering any open-ended piece of work where you should not critique the work itself uh, for, the, for the conclusion that some people draw. It is certainly not the case that all people looked at that work and saw panic in it. In fact, the negative team said so much as to say that not all people had the same opinion from it, that the outcome was unclear, that some people had certain interpretations of it. As the affirmative team, we say that we recognize these different opinions and that the nature of emotional misinformation, as the second uh, negative uh, speaker coined, is not a necessary outcome of the piece and is, fact, and is in fact not a key outcome of the piece. Um, another element of the effect of the piece of art the negative team put forward is how it conflicts with the existing reputation of the age as a uh, institution, as a publication. The first uh, negative speaker put forward this idea that all proper media outlets are this uh, law abiding uh, are these law abiding institutions that seek to promote purely facts to the public. This is simply not true. Obviously, all media has bias, and this is universal. Obviously, the pe the people behind the age, not just the institution, the editorial staff, each journalist in the age will have their own opinion. There are journalistic standards; these are maintained. As the affirmative team, we believe that in the interest of freedom of expression, the age did maintain their journalistic standards in allowing this piece of work to be published. We believe that the age was then, then later misstepped in sacking, in sacking learning for the work after they heard the public response. Overall, this means that learning should not have been sacked and that within the journalistic standards of the age, this work is reasonable and as we have established, a reasonable critique of policy, not misinformation. What we need to focus in, in, standards of mis, uh, sorry, in standards of publication is that we do not deceive the public. That is the fundamental thing. The piece of work that learning produced relies solely on the pre-existing understandings of the people to form the opinions that the negative team critiques. It is not the work itself that forms the opinion for those people. Therefore, it is unreasonable to punish learning for the interpretation of others when they often use their pre-existing understandings to form the conclusions that are now being critiqued. The other element that I, uh, that I would like to bring up is the extent to which the piece of art makes an improper characterization of, of the Andrews government policy. Now, as the affirmative team, we would put forward that the nature of vaccine mandates in this pandemic have been unprecedented, com unprecedented compared to the past many decades of government action. We think it is above the normal level of government action over the past many decades to impose, uh, to require people to get vaccinated to maintain their professions, uh, to enter certain and to enter certain spaces. We would argue that this is greater than the baseline. Therefore, it is natural for people to have a discussion about this, to be outraged by this. There are discussions on both sides. We acknowledge that. There are many pieces of art which have supported such a mandate which have critiqued people for being selfish, for not wanting the vaccine, all those are good. All this whole spectrum of art and expression that has come out of the pandemic is beneficial. Lunig is one small part of that, and you cannot punish a per an artist for creating a piece of work that presents perspective, that does not spread misinformation, and that does not necessarily lead to an outcome which causes harm to society. We think it is reasonable for people like Lunig to form a critique of an unprecedented response to the pandemic and to have a proper good debate about it. So we come to this next question as an overall theme between our two teams. Was the art misleading? Did it discuss fact? No, it didn't. It suggested, uh, it made an overall general critique of a certain policy. It didn't, it didn't try to discredit the efficacy of vaccines. It didn't even try to discredit the efficacy of the policy. All that a syringe pointing at a person shows is that policy is forceful. That is the connotation that it says. It does not say that that policy is good or bad for the overall outcome or the health outcome of the pandemic. All it says, all it asks the, um, all it asks the reader to, to consider is whether that policy is just and reasonable to impose a certain restriction on a certain person. We do not believe that the artwork is misleading and as the main standard of journalistic standards, learning should not have been sacked for creating a work that may have been offensive. The, um, the negative team put forward the argument that 
um, Linux artwork as an abuse of his professional position. But what is this position? He is certainly a well-respected editor at the age, but what does that entail? What sort of standards does he have to abide by? As the negative team put forward, there are journalistic standards in regard to maintaining, uh, maintaining truth in the information and not misleading the public. We see that as the absolute or the, the most important element that must be maintained in journalistic standards. Lenny did not break that. He put forward opinions. Opinion pieces are part of any publications or any journalistic publications um, scope of work. It is reasonable for an opinion piece of art to be put forward to the public and for the public to respond to that. What the age did was not preemptively censor learning, but it, was, but it was the age being afraid of the public response that they got from the art. We think that is an unreasonable reason to sack learning. It is not the fact that the age saw before the work was published that there was something wrong. It is not because the work was bad or wrong, it is because the, it, because, it is because the piece of work got a poor public response and we think that is unreasonable. And we think that is an unreasonable uh, reason for learning to be fired. Another critique we heard from the negative team was that the work does not propose a solution to the critique it makes. And again, we say art doesn't need to. There is this element uh, about art that says it poses ideas, it poses questions. Of course it is not fully rounded, the art is simple. But that simplicity is what makes it strong and is why that you cannot punish Lunig for the piece of art that he put out and to which other people attach their own pre-existing understandings. You cannot punish me for your opinion and you should not be punished for what I think. Now to summarise our team case. Um, our first speaker presented a context as to what exactly Lunig's art was putting forward. Those two uh, being the connotation with, the Tiananmen, with Tiananmen Square and the second being the connotation of violence and force uh, when, the, when the syringe is placed on the barrel of the tank. He went on to explain a distinction um, between misinformation and, and commentary on policy, explaining very clearly why learning's art is, is in fact a commentary. Uh, uh, our second speaker went on to explain how it is valuable for society um, to have critique and why it is poor form uh, and unreasonable for learning to be sacked for this piece of art. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, um, when we boil down to what exactly learning's artwork is, it is clear that it is not misinformation, it does not cause an overall harm to society, and it is unreasonable for learning to be sacked for that piece of art. Thank you. I call upon the third negative speaker, Edward Mekin. <clears throat> Sorry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The topic tonight is that Lunig should not have been sacked, and we as the negative team believe that Lunig's sacking was incredibly reasonable due to his mis severe mishandling of sensitive socio-political situations. Today, as third speaker, I will rebut the affirmative side and sum up my team's case. Firstly, on to my rebuttal. The opposition have argued numerous arguments under the theme of freedom of speech. Now, despite freedom of speech being an inherent right of every single human being, such does not protect anyone against the judgment of others. As clarified in our definition, this debate is not focused upon the legality of learning's drawing. No, such is focused upon the ethics of his firing. And there is nothing ethically or morally impure about learning's firing. 
According to the Fair Work Commission, an unfair dismissal is defined as a dismissal which is unreasonable. However, the dismissal of Michael Lunig was far from unreasonable, for such contradicted not only the ideals of the age, but also their own beliefs, providing them with more than enough reasoning for such firing. Furthermore, this image brought great outrage upon the age, judgment upon his freedom of speech, thus providing them with even more reason to sack Lunig. Additionally, this firing was completely precedented, with Lunig's freedom of speech having already played a large part in several controversies over the past few years. For example, in 2015, when he compared the Victorian governments to fascists, and then in 2019, where he published a cartoon widely perceived as quite misogynistic. In such way, Lunig's firing has been approaching for quite a while, with him repeatedly using his freedom of speech for offensive, harmful comments, which are incredibly unethical and instigate negative change. Lunig was not using freedom of speech. He was using freedom of hate, a freedom which the age reasonably and understandably blocked. The opposition have suggested that Michael Lunig is an instigator of positive change, aiding society in both the past and the present. However, such is quite wrong. Whilst Michael Lunig states that his job is to challenge the status quo, little of his cartoons have done such. Instead of challenging the status quo, they criticise it, offering no alternative and no option for change. Such criticism is clearly displayed in the cartoon he was fired for. Instead of suggesting ways in which the, the pandemic could be managed or routes to Andrews could take to achieve safety, Loney compared vaccination mandates to Tiananmen Square, suggesting instead that people should not get vaccinated, yet presenting nothing else. Let me ask you, ladies and gentlemen, how many times have you changed just based on criticism? How many times have you striven to become better without knowing how? Improvement is impossible without knowledge of methods to improve. And thus, Lunig's cartoons do not instigate positive social change. They just usher chaos, drawing people to become unhappy and resistant without any potential for change. Lunig is not vital for positive change, for all his contributions are negative. The opposition have furthermore claimed um, that the image posted by Lunig um, produced little produced positive harm and thus should not have been a cause for his firing. As detailed by the second negative speaker, within his cartoon, Lunig severely mishandled the socio-political situation regarding both Tiananmen Square and the coronavirus, making light of an event in which over 10,000 innocent people were murdered. Similarly, Within this cartoon, Lunig discourages vaccination, discrediting a known method of protecting people with a disease which has resulted in the deaths of over 6.5 million people worldwide. With this image, Lunig draws a comparison between a simple policy attempting to save lives to a horrific event in which, which two millions are tied to worldwide. In such way, through posting this image, Lunig did not consider the harm and offence his image would create, only instead promoting his political views. And thus, this image was, not, was harmful, not only to the reputation of the age, which faced massive backlash, and not only to the emotional state of all those related to it, either through the massacre or through COVID, but also to the potential medical emergencies caused by Lunig's discouragement of vaccination, resulting in further deaths and further grief. The second affirmative speaker said that... Um, said that Lunig's artwork was not challenging facts. However, this artwork exaggerates the, the magnitude of this issue, uh, the magnitude of a very impactful issue, thus stemming from it misinformation. She furthermore stated that, um, they, that Michael Lunig has been deplatformed. Deplatforming is different from firing. The idea, the provoking of thought and conversation to be had are not being suppressed. Luna can continue fostering all of these without being associated with the age. There are better ways to encourage change than just simple criticism. The third negative speaker also said that each news source should possess their own views. 
yet also said they should allow adverse views to be published within their own media site, contradicting both himself and his whole team line. Over the course of this debate, we, the negative team, have argued that it was responsible, reasonable for Michael Lunig to be sacked due to his mistreatment of sensitive socio-political situations, issues. The first negative speaker stated our team case by describing the detrimental effects of Lunig's inconsiderateness, his weaponization of the cartoons, his lack of knowledge and lack of care for people's opinions and people's views. He furthermore went on to discuss the rights of the age to fire Looney, discussing the way in which they were completely reasonable in firing Looney and um, committing to their own political views. The second negative speaker thus spoke of Lunig's emotional impacts and the offensiveness of his cartoon, describing the way in which such offended many people without providing an alternative to change. Finishing her speech by arguing that Lunig's sacking was precedented. And thus, through this reasons, despite any good produced by Lu Michael Lunig, despite any positive change produced by him over the past few years at the age. His downfall was of his own accord. His downfall was all due to him and his mistreatment of socio sensitive socio-political situations. Not any others. His sacking was reasonable, his sacking was moral. And thus, we, the uh, negative team, claim that Lloyding sacking was incredibly, um, was completely reasonable. Thank you. While the adjudicators finalise the result, I will read this evening's chairman's notices. Firstly, we're delighted to announce that the grand finals will be held in the House of Assembly Chamber, Parliament House, on Saturday, the 24th of September, 2022. Secondly, would you like to be an adjudicator for primary school debates in 2023? Adjudicating is a great community service and it will help you improve your own debating. See the information desk for more information about how to sign up. Thirdly, Topic and side information for the semi-finals will be available on the Debating SA website from tomorrow morning. Please be sure to check your side and debate time information carefully. Debates will be held here at the same venue next week. Thank you.
triple dinghies. Edward. <laughs> so close. <laughs> Can we Edward, do you have any Roman color from the edit ever today? I invite the representative of the adjudication panel to come forward to announce the result. Both teams have done extremely well to get this position. Um, I don't know why I'm laughing. You have. Um, but but um, no, so you've done very well to get the position. Um, the debate um, dealt with subject matter potentially that, that, that may have been a bit complicated to debate um, on either side. So you've done very well both to get here and you've done very well within the debate itself. So congratulations. Um, is the panel adjudication, um, so we won't go into in-depth reasoning or feedback. We will give a brief summary of the reasons for our decision. And we'll tell you the split, if it's split or whether it's unanimous. Um, we'll also award the different debating awards. So I'll go first to the reasoning and the outcome. Um, the panel, as a panel, um, we made a unanimous decision. That decision was based on the fact that one team provided a more direct and comprehensive argument than Team Case. Um, on that basis, it was awarded tonight to the affirmative. So congratulations. Um, Um, as the Division Brain Award was awarded to Ilya, so well done. Again, congratulations, I'll leave it to you, Chairman. I call upon a member of the runner up team to give a vote of thanks. Um, we'd just like to thank everybody, I guess, first off for being civil. It is a bit awkward to debate your own school, and we are very happy for you, even though we are the ones who lost, and we look forward to seeing your further success, and we want to thank you for a very challenging debate. We will admit we kind of struggled with this, um, but you guys did an absolutely wonderful job. Thank you to um, our coordinators and our coaches, and yeah, it was amazing. Thank you so much. I call upon a member of the winning team to second that vote of thanks. I'd like to thank the panel of adjudicators for their adjudication both tonight and over the course of, of the season. It's always very much appreciated by us as debaters. I'd like to thank the opposition especially for putting together a very good debate. Um, we've both had a good season and um, it's really great to be here both at quarterfinals and to have a good debate on a very substantial topic. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. I now declare this debate closed.